Hey guys, this lecture is going to go over natural selection. And natural selection is a way that evolution, change pretty much, takes place in an area or how it affects organisms like animals and plants. So as usual, what you need to record in your note sheet is going to be color coded. It's either going to be yellow or it's going to be blue. Um, for the most part, I think it's yellow or blue. I will try to highlight with my laser or underline in a different color to like draw your attention to it. And I tried really hard this time to give you enough time so that you can write everything down and you know get it all down on your notes. So here we go. Okay, so all animals live in what's called an ecosystem. Your ecosystem is gonna be everything around you, all the other animals that live with where you live, all the plants that live where you live, how much water you get, if you live in a desert, if you live in a rainforest, all of those things are going to make up your ecosystem. One thing that all ecosystems have in common is the fact that they all have a certain amount of resources. So we're going to use the word finite to describe those resources. Finite is just another way of saying that something is limited. We only have a certain amount of it. So if you get $20 for your allowance every month, that's a finite amount. You're only getting $20. When it's done, it's done. It means you can't buy anything more. So in an ecosystem, the things that are finite or the things that are limited are going to be nutrients, water, and energy. So everything that lives in that environment is going to need and going to have to use the same nutrients, water, and energy. So go ahead and write down what the word finite means and write down what ecosystems are limited to, like what in an ecosystem is limited. All right, we're going to move on to the next slide now. Okay, so because you have just a couple or just a little bit of water, a little bit of food, and a little bit of energy in your ecosystem, it means that everything that's living there is going to have to compete for those three things. So that's competition. Competition is just when different organisms have to share a resource that's limited. We all have to drink water. We all have to eat food. We all need energy. At some point, the water is going to kind of run out and only some of us will get water. At some point the food is going to kind of run out and only some of us will get food. So that's what competition is. Go ahead and write down your definition for competition. Okay, so because we have both competition, we have other organisms that we're that's going to use the same things that we use and we only have a certain amount of those three things that we all need in order to live it means that not every member of your species is going to survive you're going to have some animals and even some plants that are going to die because they can't get what they need okay so within a population because of competition and because of finite resources not every member of that species or that group or that population is going to live. Some of them are going to die. So every ecosystem can sustain or support a maximum amount of species, and that's known as your carrying capacity. So your carrying capacity, and you should be writing this down, is the maximum number of species that can survive in a given ecosystem. Okay, there's just enough water, food, and energy for 30 animals to live here, or 50 animals to live here, or 60 plants to live here, or whatever it is. It's just how many can I support totally. So think of your house. In your house, if you only have a certain number of rooms, then you can only have a certain amount of people living there. Like if you have four bedrooms, you might be able to have eight people living there if you put two people in each room. But if you have four bedrooms, there's no way that 64 people can live in your house. It has a carrying capacity. It can only hold a certain amount of people. All right, you should have gotten that down, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Now... When your population continues to grow, sometimes it's going to get larger than your carrying capacity. You're going to have 
way more organisms than you have food and water and stuff like that. So think of like when you have holidays or when we have holidays and you have family that come over to stay. You might have 16 people in your house when your house really should only have about 8 people. So that's an example of how your population is going to get larger than your carrying capacity. What it means for an animal or for a plant is that there's not going to be enough food or water to support all of them. Okay, so when the carrying capacity gets, or when the population, sorry, gets larger than the carrying capacity, there's not going to be enough food or water to support all the living organisms in that population. All right, hopefully you're taking this down. All right, next slide. All right, so it means that only your healthy organisms, only your healthy population is going to live. Because once we start competing for food and water, if you're not healthy, you're probably not going to eat or drink. So think of like a, a cheetah running after like a wildebeest or something in Africa. If the cheetah is sick, it's not going to run that fast. It's not going to catch the wildebeest. It's not going to have food. So only if the animal or the plant is healthy is it going to survive if the carrying capacity gets larger than the, um, sorry, if the population gets larger than the carrying capacity. So what does the carrying capacity depend on? Well, it depends on a couple of things. The amount of water that's available, the amount of nutrients that are available, and the amount of energy that's available. Pretty much your carrying capacity depends on your limited resources, those finite resources that we talked about. So let's look at this graph. This graph shows, now see this dotted line? That's going to represent the carrying capacity. Again, this is the maximum amount of organisms that can live here. Okay, and this line that's doing its little loop-de-loop -loop right here that represents your population. So as long as we are underneath this carrying capacity line, everyone can pretty much survive because that means that there is enough food and water and nutrients to go around. But as soon as we get over this carrying capacity line, we're going to start having problems because there's not enough food and water and nutrients to go around anymore. So that's where our weaker and sicker animals are going to die off and our healthy animals are going to stay alive. So that's why this graph does that little, you know, that's why it's like, hold on, let me get my laser. That's why it's moving up and down, up and down, and up and down, and up and down here. Wherever it's up and down, that shows you where some animals die off. And then we have a whole bunch of babies born, and the population goes up again, and then some more die off. And then it just keeps going up and down, and up and down, and up and down. So hopefully you're able to get down what the graph shows. Okay, so we have an area that we all live in. There's only so much water and food. That means some of us are going to die. Which are the animals that are going to survive? Well, the ones that survive is based on the ad adaptations that those animals have. So we're going to go ahead and talk about this. You don't have anything to write down for this slide. So what is an adaptation? It is an ability or a feature that gives you an edge. It's something that allows you to survive in your environment. So go ahead and take a few minutes, well, seconds really, and write down a definition for adaptation. All right, so again, an adaptation is just a feature that you have or an, or an ability that you have that is going to give you an edge and allow you to survive in your ecosystem. So if you look at, like, let's look at these plant roots, for example. These guys live in the desert. So this plant has really, really deep roots, which means it's going to be able to get water that other plants can't get because their roots don't go as deep. Whereas this plant has roots that spread out really, really far. So when rain does fall, it can pick up water like a along a greater distance. So these would be adaptations that would allow these plants to live versus another plant. 
So let's say we had like just a regular plant that's supposed to be grass, and it just has little roots that don't go very far. Well, this guy isn't going to live for very long because his roots don't go deep, and they're not a lot of roots. So he's going to dry out pretty quickly. Whereas these guys will live because they have that adaptation where their roots go long deeper or their roots spread out more and they can get more water. So that's an example of an adaptation. All right, so again, this slide just goes over the fact that roots are adaptations of plants, and only some plants have them, and it allows them to get water, and it allows them to get nutrients very, very easily. So like something like a lichen, for example, that has no roots, won't be able to live for very long because there's no way for it to get water or nutrients. Okay, next. So on your note sheet, you should have some pictures. And at this point, all we're going to do is just go through examples. And what I want you to write down is just a little summary for that picture. So here we go. These are um, plants that have really big and broad leaves. So like I'm kind of outlining them. And these are going to be plants that live at, or in, sorry, a rainforest, like banana trees. These look like... Um, in the Caribbean, we call this callaloo. It's kind of like a, a family of spinach. It's just really, really big. But anyway, they live at, on the ground, like way at the bottom in a rainforest. So they're not getting a whole lot of sunlight because there are all these taller trees that are like shading them from the sun. But you know that all plants need sunlight so that they can make their own food through photosynthesis. Well, look at how big these guys' leaves are. The bigger the leaf is, the more sunlight it can get, even though there might be bigger plants, like kind of blocking the sun out. So plants that live at the bottom of a forest floor tend to have big leaves because they, they need to still be able to get as much sunlight as possible, and those leaves will allow them to collect sunlight easily. All right, so if underneath that picture, you just want to say big leaves, or you want to write adaptations, Big leaves allow them to get sunlight. These guys are termites. Hold on a second. Sorry for moving the slide around. Let me get my laser going. Right. Maybe I should get my pen going. So these guys are termites. Sorry that took so long. And they eat wood. And wood is really, really hard to digest. So inside of them, like inside their little stomachs, they have these tiny little bacteria that actually eat the wood for them. So this is another example of an adaptation. Now termites are very closely related to ants. Well, you don't see ants eating wood. Like there are no ants in your house eating all the wooden things in your house. But if you got termites in your house, they would eat all the wooden things. So having these microorganisms is actually an adaptation that allows these termites to eat something that their cousins, the ants, would not be able to eat. So it gives them another place or another way to get food. It's an alternative food source. All right, and this guy is a giant ant eater. They're really, really big and really shaggy. And they have these really huge and sharp claws. And a lot of people are scared of them because they think, like, you know, they'll hurt them or something. But they actually eat ants and termites. Now, the sharp claws are adaptations to allow them to, like, tear up the barks of trees. Like, if you look at this picture right here, here are his claws. And he's, like, literally, like, ripping this tree apart, so looking for ants. And then they have this long, thin nose. And out of their long, thin nose, they have a really long, sticky tongue. So it almost looks like their head or nose area can fit into like little tiny spaces. Well, it's true. Their head is adapted to fit into spaces where ants would normally live. And then they shoot out their sticky tongue and just kind of like pick all the ants up and then slurp it back into their mouth. So these are really good adaptations for an ant eater, and it allows him to survive where other animals wouldn't be able to survive because they couldn't get to food. Now, while having different adaptations is going to allow an organism to live for a longer period of time, it's not going to make it invincible. Everything is going to die at some point, okay? So adaptations allow organisms to live longer. Sorry, I keep moving the slide around. Okay, so adaptations allow 
organisms to live longer, but everything still dies. So how do we prevent populations from completely dying out? How come things don't always go extinct? Well, if members of the species can successfully reproduce, that means that they can make a baby that will grow up and make babies of its own, then the species continues to live. So the individual animal may die, like this frog will die. But see all these little black looking dots like here and here, like in the water? Well, those are frog eggs. So if those frog eggs grow up into baby frogs and then eventually into adult frogs, and they have babies of their own, this type of frog will never die out, even though the individuals die, okay? So in order for a species to survive, then its members, its organisms, have to be able to successfully reproduce. And again, successfully reproducing just means that they make babies, that will make babies, and those babies will make babies, and it'll just keep going. Okay, so let's go back to this graph that showed what happened when um, a population got bigger than the carrying capacity. Well, when this little scenario right here happens, when you have too many organisms, then we have resources, that is food and water, we know that some of those organisms are going to die. Well, the ones that survive are going to be the ones with the best adaptations, okay? So when a population gets bigger than the carrying capacity, the only animals that are going to live, the only members of the population that are going to live, are going to be the ones with the best adaptations, the ones that have that edge, that extra ability that allows them to survive. This is what the term survival of the fittest means. It means having the adaptations necessary to allow you to keep living. All right. And now if you can survive long enough, then it means at some point you'll be able to reproduce. And I'm sorry that this is right here. It should say reproduce. Right there. Sorry, my handwriting is so bad. But anyway, so let's look at these pictures. So we have a whole bunch of plants with different types of roots, and these all grow in the desert. So the plants with the longest roots are going to be the ones that will probably survive the longest to have kids of their own or, you know, little plants. So that would be this plant right here and this one and that one. Okay, so these three will probably survive, and they'll reproduce, and they'll make more baby plants. Now here's a picture of a cheetah, and the cheetah is known as being the fastest cat, the fastest animal, well, at least land animal. They can run about 60 to 70 miles per hour. Now, the faster that that cheetah can run, the more chances it has, or the better chances it has, of catching its prey and killing it and eating it. And if it can have food and eat food, then it's probably going to survive to have babies, and those babies will have babies. So, just kind of an example of how having good adaptations will allow you to survive long enough so that you can reproduce. Okay. Now remember, all of this information, all of these abilities, the ability of the cheetah to run really fast, the ability of these desert plants to grow really, really deep roots or really, really wide roots is kept in their DNA. So that's where all that information is being stored, in the DNA of the organism. Now, the, that DNA is going to make instructions as for that particular gene, for that ability, and those instructions are going to be found in the genes of the organisms. I'll give you a minute to copy that down. Now, when a when two organisms mate and they produce an offspring, they're going to pass their genes down to their offspring. So any adaptations that they have, any special abilities that they have, that's going to get passed down in the genes to their offspring. So that means that the new baby is going to have that adaptation as well. And if that new baby makes or you know grows up and has offspring with someone else with good adaptations, over time the entire population 
of that particular species will, if it's a cheetah, it'll become faster. If it's a plant, it might have longer roots. It's just going to allow that population to keep surviving in the ecosystem that it already lives in. Okay, so the process of organisms with the best adaptations surviving and passing on their genes to their offspring is known as natural selection. So it's natural selection because it's almost like nature is selecting them, like humans don't really have a big part to play in it. So again, natural selection is what happens when organisms with the best adaptations mate and have offspring and pass those adaptations down to their offspring in their genes. Okay, oh, sorry, this is kind of cut off at the top. But anyway, so this slide is just kind of going over. Um, at some point, some or in all of these animals are going to die, but you need to remember that the weak animals and the sick animals are always going to more than likely die first. And if they die early, they don't reproduce. Like if you die when you're a baby, you're not old enough to have children of your own. So the weaker you are, the sicker you are, the more unhealthy you are, the younger you die, the more likely that you did not make any kids. So those bad genes, we can think of them kind of like that, those bad genes are going to die when you die. All right. Now, if this happens continually over and over again, eventually your population is going to change and it's going to become more and more adapted, more suited to the environment or the ecosystem in which it lives. Okay, so... Some animals do avoid competition with others. They, they don't have to worry about the food that they eat or where they live or the water that they drink or anything like that. And the way that they do it is they fill what we call a niche. Now you should have learned this word in like middle school, but niche is like, you, it's not just your habitat, it's your role, it's your job in the community that you live in. So everything from where you live to what you eat. So a way that organisms can avoid competition with each other is by filling different niches, having different jobs, having different roles. So we're going to look at an example real quick. All right. This is an anole lizard. They're, they're really small, maybe about the size of my hand. Yeah, not very big at all. But there are lots and lots of different species of them. And they all live in pretty much the same forests. And the way that they coexist, the way that they all live together in the same forest without, like, killing each other or without one completely, like, being, you know, completely dying off because of competition is because they fill different niches. Some of these little lizards will live high up in trees. Others are going to live kind of in the middle of the tree, like on the trunk. Others will live way down at the bottom, like in the little grass or in the little shrubs um, of the trees. Some of them only eat fruit. Some of them only eat bugs that can be found on the ground. Some of them eat bugs that fly in the air. So they don't really eat the same food and they don't live in the same place. So they very rarely compete with each other for the same things. All right, so this sums up the lecture on natural selection. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you instructions for the rest of the day. Please know that these lectures are available on YouTube. And you just have to search for, like, the, the main heading of your notes. And they're also available on our Edmodo page. Like, I repost them so that you can have them there. All right. Goodbye.